thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here to the Institut Français. Uh, we are here, uh, as uh, we were told, um, in order to discuss about a vast subject, what is the situation of poetry and writing uh, today in France and in Finland? It's an enormous question that we have. Or what is it like to write professionally? And in order to speak about this uh, theme, we have uh, two real poets, uh, Matti and Lekka, uh, who are in the very middle of the situation of writing poetry today. So uh, we will see, as we will see soon, they do poetry, but they do very many other things as well, like music, uh, theatre, image, research, ed edition, a lot of different things. And maybe we will also speak about uh, the situation of poetry uh, as a situation in which you probably need to deal with other things than only works or other things than only poetry today. This is where we are going to, uh, maybe going uh, to a little bit later. And uh, I will uh, also leave a little bit of time, I hope, uh, at the end of the discussion for your questions. Don't so uh, think about them if you have any, and I can also translate them into English if necessary. Uh, we are speaking English because because it's a neutral round. We have one Finnish speaking poet, one French speaking, so English will be the lingua franca today. Um, so uh, I will uh, maybe start with uh, our poets and and their poetry, presenting uh, them both. So Yekta, first, uh, let's start with you. You are a French poet. Uh, published in several journals. Uh, I saw Piro, Averi, Bacanal, Borborigno, etc., many of them. And I have seen that you already have three books. Is, is that so? A Veilleur Saint Visage, Registre des Ombres, Brisé pour l'étranger, uh, that we have, uh, unfortunately, don't have here <laughs> with us. But we will try to get them. So I would first like to uh, ask you about. Uh, maybe the sources or the origins of poetry, how you come to do poetry. And uh, this is a terrible question, of course, to, to pose to a poet. Uh, what is your poetic world? What is your poetic language? And this is why I will tell you how I read you. And you can then say if you find this reasonable or completely false. Okay. So when I was reading your texts, I had a feeling that you are a kind of a poet who writes somehow exposed to the world, exposition to the world was the word that came to me, because it's not somehow a psychological poetry that expresses somebody's feelings, but it's more like a, a poetry that's out in the world, uh, encounters quite difficult situations as well, it feels to, seems to me, uh, brutal sometimes, pitiless sometimes, not only with this joyous parts as well, but I felt some uh, jump, uh, run into some complicated passages like of dark descent. Yeah. I was born in the dive of a plane that crashed 47 seconds after takeoff. I was born in skids in off ride slides, in spins and somersaults and pileups and so on. So it's, it's quite dark. So this was one side. So is it um, is this uh, feeling of expo worthy of exposition? Does it seem fine to you? And this is also something that came to me when I was thinking about what you say about language, because uh, reading your text uh, it did not give me the impression that you would be somehow uh, once again expressing your deep feelings, but or on the contrary being exposed to whatever languages, words, senses of language, meanings happen to be there. This maybe came, came to me because of these passages. I am the cage of gods who sleep in the depths of language, the black deletions, the other side of texts, uh, the last home spell snow, I'm the empty envelope that travels looking for the message that an unknown recipient hides in its memory. So uh, this seems to me like once again you find something in the world, maybe even in the reader's memory or something. Does this seem reasonable to you or completely false? Uh, 
absolutely right. Um, everything is quite uh, accurate, but there's a lot of things, so I gather. And I think you're right. I think when I began, I was in emotion, uh, inside feelings, and pure inside feelings. And uh, I don't know, I think I evolved um, opening myself to the world, thinking that um, I could deal with what was surrounding me, and uh, it's not very original, but um, suffering feelings uh, from outside. And what you read of Dark Descent and all that stuff, that's a different book from the other. And this one goes further in the outside. It's very urban. Um, and I try to say things on the city that have uh, never been said before, uh, something different. And I try to go, as you said it, as you put it, inside the language. Um, Difficult to put it in English or to say it with words, but um, not only it's very important having a vision and put it in words, but working sometimes inside the language. So that um, goes with what you were saying about this uh, unknown recipient, how it's against me, and so on. Um, so uh, it does not mean that I'm not expressing my emotions, but maybe in a different way. Um, maybe in a different way, and something maybe that could explain that position is the importance of images in my <coughs> poetry. Uh, I think it's not always the case, so that's mm -hmm. different strings, but the image is very important. And the fact that the image must be uh, moving in itself. Um, not disturbing, but maybe disturbing, that it changes the way it it's changes from the way we see things usually. So if I'm writing something and this is just what I see, to go from what people see, say, okay, this is, this is useless. I have to go further. I have to go mm -hmm. on the other side. Thank you. Uh, so in order to. Uh to change sides, I will uh, turn towards Matti Damaskoski, who is also a, a poet of three books, as far as I know. So there is Tärdes Tärdes Inustanit Tuntu, Sydänmarsi, and Pääkaloni Uutpunt. But you are always, uh, uh, you are also a, a researcher and an editor, and we are even going to be colleagues very soon at the Collegium of Mars Studies. Yes, starting today. Starting today, so this is how it starts. <laughs> Collegium is present. Uh, and I, I would also like uh, to ask you about the way you are writing or where your poetry comes from or what is the source or origin of the poetry. It's a bit the same question as I posed to Yekta, not any easier. I'm not Origins able to do it. And, uh, and my reader's impression of your poetry is actually uh, the, the first impression was a bit similar to Yekta's, so I think it's not a coincidence that you are here to, together today. Because uh, there is also the side of uh, being exposed to the world, not, not so much the poet's self-reflection, but somehow, well, I'll give you my image. It was like walking in the streets of, you no, know, being a piece of paper pushed by a wind at the streets of Helsinki on a on a rage September day. This kind of a feeling I got when I was reading uh, a lot of uh, your texts in a, in a row. Yeah. So, uh, once again, there's, there seems to be people, situations, maybe even political situations that you describe somehow or you come up to, and then, then whatever reactions there are come from these uh, encounters. This, is, this was my reader's feeling. And so, so this is maybe my first question: Is it just, does this seem familiar to you? And then, uh, uh, when it comes to language itself, which is of course your first tool, I guess uh, it seems some it seems very multiple to me actually, because there's passages which are very discreet and close to ordinary speech, and then suddenly, puff, some kind of a very very strong uh, image, surprising image. Uh, that comes to break it uh, or transform it all. And then, then you have also quite a lot of uh, formal uh, games yes. that are very different from that. So, yeah. 
So this does this go to any sensible sense from your point of view? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, I will give you a binary answer. And uh, there's a, a binary situation in the book, as in, in my latest book, which is this, the Bagalonawatu, which could be translated as skull negotiations. Um, the piece of paper that's been thrown around uh, in Helsinki, in the grey September Helsinki street, would be the character of the skull. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's a, that's a nice description. Um, what, I, what I myself think that I'm doing is that I am, the skull figure is um, encountering the world sort of as it is, not quite as reality, but a little bit on an objective level, like he sees, he or she, that is not uh, gendered in Finnish, it's just a skull, sees forms, hears sounds, smells uh, smells, and so on, and then interprets this uh, in certain ways, and then gets bounced by like, dislike, yes, no, uh, here and there, I'll sit a little bit to the right, I'll sit a little bit to the left, so, and this would be the paper kind of bouncing, I think, the image um, that goes around. So, so things that are then interpreted how the world is uh, and how the city and how the society somehow encounters with people are interpreted into lived experience from uh, encounters that are really something different or not necessarily what they are interpreted as. This would be my uh, first side of the binary uh, answer. We had another question. I forgot. It's about the language. Right. Right. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it was a real question. It was a notice about the language, which right. seems right. as well right. to be a, um, maybe an encounter of the way the words are already there. I don't, I don't yeah. know. So with the with the language, with the sort of poetic. Um, poetics of the book. There's prose stuff, which I think goes with the sort of quotidian experience, but then I try to trace, trace the movements of the mind of the character somehow on the page. So that makes four different forms as well. Of course, it's a part of like, I have, I have my Mallarmé moment over there, uh, which I did across uh, one spread. Um, and so on. So it's a mix of prose, it's a mix of different poetic forms. The other side of the binary answer is about origins of poetry. We all know what that is, of course. Um, so it's, I don't know, I have no idea. Like there is a, there is, I can uh, explain things to myself, why I'm doing this, why I'm trying to do this. And my explanation is that I'm trying to explore the world, I'm trying to explore the, the experience and make that somehow uh, visible on the paper on, or whatever it is, performance, something. But really, I, I, I don't know. I don't like where it comes from, I, I really don't know. Yes, I appreciate your uh, rich answers to, uh, to an impossible question, of course. But let us, uh, let us go, uh, go on and uh, connect this uh, poetic question to this uh, uh, larger situation we have here because tomorrow you are going to do something uh, together and mixed with music and I know that both of you uh, actually do music and theater and many other things as well so I would like to ask you uh, where this musical thing comes from so Yekta first how do you see the relation between music and poetry or how uh, how did you come into this musical uh, or scenic uh, thing? Know that the traditional poets actually are in a small room, and right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, there are two questions because my, um, I mean, the music is in itself um, in my poetry. Not really the music, but the rhythm. 
some kind of flow, and this is very really important. If there is no music, you know, it's not music, it's rhythm. And maybe it's not, uh, yeah, it's rhythm, and rhythm is something quite organic, but there's a rhythm, so it can go fast, go slow, it can go fast and go slow, but this, my first answer about music would be inside the language. And then, um, your question was, yeah, I w uh, was speaking to music, and um, I think that when you first you think of a song, the first thing I was thinking with poetry and music, okay, I'm going to write a song. Mm -hmm. This is not a song for me, a poem is not a song. You can do things, but you realize quite soon that you're kind of limited. So what I try to do is to make the music um, Answering the field of poetry, but um, to, um, so to, uh, to carry it, to put it um, further. And so, um, I'm losing my answer the question. Um, uh, about stage, yeah. Uh, I think that music and poetry together uh, both go further. So I know that sometimes people say that if you put music with your poetry, it might mean that your poetry is not good or that the music is not good enough, but that's not my point of view. Uh, I'm looking for the word in English. Transcender, transcendence. Uh, to transcend. Yeah, each poetry and, and music. This is quite this is a blurry answer. But, uh, it's, yeah. yeah, I have a feeling reading you that, that uh, their language is quite musical as it is, so it's somehow uh, um, uh, agreeable to say aloud, for instance. Yeah. It's sayable Absolutely. or, or thinkable or respirable somehow. So I, I guess in your case, this might be a source, the source of the musical part already. In the language. Absolutely. But there's something more. Um, Charles Baudelaire was saying something about that. He was saying that poetry uh, was aiming at um, making. Uh, things appearing in the mind of people and he was using, he said that poets were kind of wizards and I like this thing, it's like, um, I mean it's maybe too much but you all know um, the three witches in Macbeth yeah. and the way they're speaking, uh, by the pricking of my thumb something wicked this way comes. Mm -hmm. This is this, this illustrates what Charlotte was saying, so very important. The music inside the poetry, but more the rhythm and some rhythmical patterns in the in the poems. Yeah. 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 And I have the I have the same similar kind of a question to you as well, of course, because uh, I know that you uh, do music actually. Uh, uh, can you call it music? What you do with Black Morelison? You have a group which is making scenic things which have musical elements as well There's and I know sound. you have a guitar so this is a musical instrument so what is the order of these different elements to you? How do you combine them? How did you come to it? Mm. Yes, so there is um, trying to think of a way of answering this uh, that makes sense uh, so yeah, we have what I let's start with this. I just start talking and then see if something comes out. Uh, so um, we have this, you could call it a band of three poets that we do text-based um, performances. Text-based would would mean in this case that we have text poetry that we take as a starting point, but then we create, we try to create an event with that. And different kinds of um, could call them musical instruments. I play the guitar, but I don't necessarily play melodies or chords or anything. I just might, might make sounds. Um, we have used, for example, typewriters. We uh, mic a typewriter up and put it through a bunch of guitar pedals, and then it comes out as as crazy noise. Or uh, we have had leaf blowers. Um, shredders, paper shredders. So we try to um, 
And what I think about that and the performance side of, of that, that you have the text, you have the words, but then with these elements, you create a performance that has a certain kind of effect. And uh, this, you never know what the effect in, in the, you can't control the effect, but you can try to point it towards a direction. So this is what I, I think about the combining different elements. So you have the words that, that guide it or are part of it, but then you create an effect with the assemblage of, of things. And in, in Helsinki, if we're trying to a little bit go to the poetry today, uh, sideline it somehow, in Helsinki there is a, uh, quite a bit of these kinds of events that you could go and see poetry that is not just uh, read as if it were on paper, but it's uh, performed in, in, in various ways. So you have stage poetry, you have events like we did in, or you organized the Moral Machines arts pro program. We have Runoku, for example, that begins today. Events like uh, tomorrow, for example, that we might talk about later on. So it's part of also part of the kind of scene that encourages the mixing of, of uh, various artistic elements, I, I suppose. And I think this is, this is uh, Especially for the performance of poetry, it's great. I'm not sure if it, how it affects writing, but it's good. And do you have the same kind of a, a scene in, in France as well? Do you, uh, is, is it common that poets go and do this kind of thing? Yeah. And uh, summers? Yeah, except that in France, um, yeah, you really got, uh, got several things. You got, uh, I don't know in Finland, but you got big um, slam stage in France, especially in Paris. So this is one of it. I'm not really into it. I respect it, but that's not my cup of tea. Um, I mean, I'm not participating in slam stage. Uh, then you got very, um, how do you say, um, someone speaking with music behind, but just speaking with music, and then you got that kind of stuff. But what is important, what Mathis said, is that I do not write for performing. I mean, I'm writing my poetry, and then I'm thinking, okay, can I put it on stage? And it's not really theater, it's more putting in space. And it's quite important for me. So you got actions, you can have movies, um, and uh, so that's the idea. And this is about music also. So. Um, uh, there are so much different experiences, and then so you got the musician, and you don't know him. So you arrive on stage, and you say hello, and you just chit chat for five minutes, and then it goes. So it's pure improvisation. Um, I like, uh, Matty said that sometimes it's not music, it's not melody, because um, with poetry it's different. So noise are kind of uh, special sounds are also and um, and and to, um, I'm working on a spoken word project with a friend, and um, there is this music and also a lot of uh, sampling from um, trains, uh, whistle, cars, uh, lions roaring, everything, animals, industry, kind of stuff. I think that's interesting. So we got the full answer. Wonderful. And then uh, tomorrow, uh, so you are going to play together uh, in Runoku uh, with a um, genre blending, very, very genre blending thing, I am told. And I, uh, I just learned a while ago that this is, uh, you have not planned this uh, representation since a very long time either, that you have not, uh, um, how to say, known each other a very long time either. So could you tell tell us a little bit more about this event, how it came up, out, up and what are you going to do? Um, yes, so we met yesterday. <laughs> and, Don't say it. <laughs> and so we've known each other for 24 hours. Um, yeah, so, but this was the idea that we, we both um, we were put together by uh, Ronoku, by Ronoku, let's say, by Moravalla Leitto, or by Laura, because uh, I was sitting there. Um, and we were commissioned to do a piece, 
and we learned about each other that we both uh, do also music, do also performances and poetry. So, um, we I think from from my part, you can tell your part. Uh, I thought it's a nice challenge because we really don't know each other. We don't have time to practice for a long time, so it has to be a somewhat spontaneous thing or a structure within which we can work. And uh, yeah, so yesterday we met. Uh, rehearsed a little bit, uh, talked a little bit, and uh, today met again, did the same, and tomorrow we will perform. And yeah, I'll, you, you can't go. Well, it prevents us from thinking too much and being conceptual and saying, okay, we're gonna take a piece of paper and we're gonna do that. We're gonna, no. Which is doing things and it's building in real time together. So this is a very positive, positive aspect of it. And the meeting is um, always challenging. I mean, for an artist, when you um, meeting new people, it's always uh, it's always interesting. And to go into the work of someone you don't know, it's always uh, inspiring. So this is uh, also a good point. But not too much thinking. thinking. Good way of working. You have the, the brain uh, in the fingers, not here, but just uh, in the fingers. And will we have in musical instruments? Uh, can can I already ask this kind of instruments or images, or is this all secret? Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so very nice. Uh, would you say? Uh, well, because you are. Uh, both mixing genres, and we will see tomorrow how you exactly do it and with what secret means. Uh, would you say uh, that this mixing of genres is a is condition of poetry today? Is it something that that is really, uh, is it your personal choice, something that you like to do? Is it something that the time imposes on you? You have to do that kind of things because of the, this is how you find the public or something? Or is it the particular kind of poetry that's being done? What, what is the role of this kind of uh, things in doing poetry today? Um, I'm, I'm, I think uh, I'm doing it because I feel it from the inside. Not because people are doing it, but maybe, especially for the music, because we are in a time where making music and making that stuff from technical points of view, I think, is easier than 20 years ago. So this is something interesting. And the other thing is that I don't think of what the audience would be waiting for, because I don't want to give them what they're waiting for. Because you can only be waiting for what you already know, I think. So, no. So this is the different thing. I try to offer something different from good or bad, but it's always a question to surprise people or something like that. Yeah, maybe, I mean, definitely one way of doing uh, something that has this sense of, of newness is to mix uh, different genres deliberately. I don't know if it's the condition of poetry. It's very difficult to know, for me at least. Um, but I will say that, especially with the uh, some, somewhat chance encounter with that we have, for example, with this, it forces two different things, let's say genres, together, and you, you then have to give up something of your own preconception to uh, for it to happen, for it to actually work in any way, you can't impose your own own thing completely. Of course, you're tied by your own thing, but you can't impose it completely. So maybe, uh, yeah, well, this is a great way of trying to get out of your own uh, comfort zone or your own uh, preconceived notions of what you should do and so on to force yourself into a situation where that happens. And that would be probably, probably good. Of course, then the performance itself feeds on writing and this is a, a specific kind of feedback loop also with the audience that you 
you start doing something and you see the audience reaction and it registers somehow that okay so this works i'll do this more i'll, I'll do more of this mm -hmm. later on and so on if you're not conscious about that then of course you uh, feed on that feedback loop for, for a longer time and it comes a specific type that you try what you said that you try to give what they expect what the audience expects but as, as we've been talking poetry should be disappointing every now and then so I, think, <laughs> yes. so I think that's one, one part of it definitely and how, how do you feel about the fact that when you yourself do many kinds of uh, many genres uh, you are necessarily uh, a great specialist of something, in this case words, and more of an amateur in others. For instance, in, I don't know if you are professional image managers or musicians, but I guess one can't be professional in everything. So uh, how do you feel about being uh, amateur in the parts of whatever you do? And on the, on the other side of the, the coin is that uh, do you ever work with specialists for instance, a, a professional composer or a professional filmmaker or something like that. And how does how do, how, do, how do you feel about that? That's where the poetic license jumps in. <laughs> <laughs> now you, yeah, that's that's a great great question. I think it's uh, you you are yeah somewhat knowledgeable about the language that you're using, uh, but then there might be some elements uh, of of instruments, music, or whatever that you don't really know, and that will be amateurish. Uh, but I mean, I think that's fine, as well, as long as you don't uh, think that it's not amateurish. Though somehow, like you're knowledgeable about the tools that you, and somewhat knowledgeable about the limits also of professionalism, then I think it's uh, it works fine. I had something else that I. But, but maybe you can chip in. Yeah, the, the, what is a professional poet? I'm wondering because the, I think, yeah, it's very so. Yeah, for the musician, I would I would question the idea of professional because it means that you're making money with your music or with your writings, or is it a question of skills? And I don't know how to answer to that. So does it mean that if you're an amateur, you have less skills than when you're a professional? I'm not sure. Uh, what I found um, precious um, is not to have to make a living of it, so you keep your freedom. If you drive for six months, you drive for six months and you don't write to do anything. If you have to make things, you do things, and it's just, yeah. Um, so, yeah, not much to say. I could add, add one thing that uh, goes to the poetry to today uh, issue a little bit, and maybe you have something to say about it as well as um, uh, digital poetry or digital literature, which requires um, for it to be uh, for it to work in the first place. It requires somebody who knows how to code things. So I can write the words, but I, I don't know how to code, and I, I would love to know how to code, and I would love to have a friend who knows to code who I could could suggest the project to do it. But this is uh, something that I think is a pressing question today, and especially for me and in, uh, in, in my context, is to find people who would be coders or writers who know how to code, so we could explore the kind of digital realm also a bit more. Yeah, I was also asking about the specialist side, because in some other domains of art today, for instance, visual arts or musical ones as well, this question precisely is coming up very much now. So you have, a, for instance, um, uh, an artist who wants to make a robot, yeah. and then he doesn't necessarily know how to build a robot. He, have, he has to cooperate with an engineer who would be, might be very happy to cooperate with an artist and, and so on. So this happens quite a lot. There is this side, collective side of art uh, here and there. Uh, I don't know if you have tried it. Uh, uh, I think you have worked with theatre people, haven't you? With theatre people? Yeah. Yeah, at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, I was in um, in a, to call that. Yeah, in a, in a group of theatre, which was. Um, 
semi-amateur, but half amateur, half professional. Um, but that was really theater. But I had this um, this man, Claude Bernard, he was the chief teacher and everything. And he was making us, um, we were making everything. Uh, theater, then we were on um, uh, stories for children, stories for adults, a little bit of poems also, so he tried to put us in danger, and it was quite hard. And that's then, in the future, I realized that um, it was really important. At that moment, I was 20, uh, 19, 20, 21, so I was young, and I didn't, didn't think that it could be so, that it would have some effects on uh, what I'm doing. Something I want to add about your question is um, between amateur and professional, you have, uh, I don't know how you put it in English, we call it art brut in French. Um, these are some people, they are not professional, but they, are, they have a lot of skills, but they are apart from the system. So they're just working. Uh, there was a lot, well, lots of uh, people in um, Asylums, for example, mm -hmm. so sick person are working, and this is very interesting. This is very, um, this is very um, achieved. There's nothing amateur about that. Mm -hmm. This is just out of the system, but this is an interesting output, and what we call the singular one, so special. Do you want to add something about uh, the, the engineers, maybe? Because now, now we are having a, a quite an interesting uh, contradiction, of an opposition actually between uh, art, where you can't really be a professional because it's about the intensity of doing it and the will of doing it. And on the other hand, there are uh, artistic means or tools like uh, digital programs or computers, some instruments as well, that you can't really use if you don't have some specific skills. So uh, I don't know, you are going to work on digital uh, poetry, maybe? Have, no. Is this what you are going to open as a question? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess then we just update the idea of a poet, poet working uh, with language only, or words only and then adopting different kinds of skills. So if you need a robot, you have to find a way to construct that robot. And it will not be uh, the same robot as MIT has built um, in, in Cambridge. It will be something, right? And then and there are, I know poets who have uh, started to teach themselves coding just by watching like, videos on YouTube. And it takes time. They, they, not so great in the beginning, but after a few years, they do, uh, I mean, I don't know how to distinguish after that, like amateur and professional, I guess I would, then it, yeah, you don't have to be professional to do, to learn these skills, I guess, so. Yeah, maybe uh, with uh, with Ben, it's, um, you have a different kind of answer, because sometimes you cannot do something, but the guitarist can do the thing, and the drummer does another thing. So, for example, I have no technical skills on the, you know, very precise uh, sound. This all really hard thing. And my friend um, does not have the skill um, of the, you know, making the, the beginning and the end of the song or cutting, editing. So it's kind of a complementarity. Mm -hmm. So you can lack skill, but if you're then in a group, you can there's some kind of equilibrium between the three people. Absolutely. The, uh, poetry is actually one of the really interesting uh, parts of life where I guess it's very difficult to say indeed who is a professional poet. So this is a tough one for you, all of this. Uh, there's one uh, other domain in which uh, a poet, whatever writer actually, gives over uh, control and accepts to be not really amateur, but not being able to control uh, the work. That's translation. And now you are going to work, tomorrow are you going to work in uh, French, in, in Finnish, or English? 
All of them? Okay. Special gift. And special gift. That's wonderful. Uh, how do you feel about being translated? How, how does it feel? And do you write in many languages? You already told me something. Yeah, but in but, private. But, yeah. uh, but in private. So. Um, I wrote, I've written one text in English with, uh, with a friend, uh, Stephen G. Fowler. And uh, it was in a project, uh, in a media project, it was published in the internet, Nemesis, Nemesia, help me, Pauli. Yes, uh, I also wrote a poem in yeah. Stephen J. Fowler. I think it was Nemesis. Nemesis, yeah. And I, I published a book. Yeah, is it released yet or not? Maybe not released yet, but it's still okay. Sorry for this. Um, thank you, Pauli. And I don't know for you. I this was my first text I wrote in English with Stephen G. Fowler. So this is the only one I wrote in a foreign language. For the rest, this is hard to to answer to give an answer because when I'm translated into Bengali, I cannot check anything. I cannot even pronounce the language. So. Um, when it's Italian, Spanish, it's um, closer to you, so you can have a look and you can have a discussion on the on the material, on the on the on the thing. But if I'm translated into uh, Macedonian, I cannot read Macedonian, so we have to go for the English. So that would be my my answer, my full answer. Um, and uh, as I was saying to you, it seems that um, the translators have a lot of difficulties to translate me not into Bengali, not into Italian, not into Swedish, but into English, as strange as it might seem. Okay. Did you, what are your experiences of being writing in another language? You did not write in English or a poem, did you? I, I have. You have? Um, How do you feel? How did you feel about it? Well, I will first say about the translation, just to sum up, I have a very similar experience. When it's Arabic, I'm, I'm super happy, because I have no idea what it is. <laughs> uh, when it's English, I am hardly that happy, because I then try to control it in a different way. But, yeah. So that would be because you have you have a very a specific relationship. Of course, I'm um, as a writer, you're knowledgeable of, of the fact that people read you however they want to read. You can't control the uh, the interpretation of the reading, but yourself, you have an idea how the effect should be, how the sound should be, and however the words should be organized. So if it's in English, then of course you try to get the idea across the same idea. Probably I shouldn't look at them at all and let the translator work. Who is right? You are the translator, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's not your mother tongue. Exactly. Um, writing in a different language, uh, definitely, as, as we talked about before, academic, uh, you write in English and in French, academic things, I also do that. And, and some performances I've done in English, I wrote for them, and it's, yeah, it's, you're hijacked into different mode. Of, of thinking different uh, language that you don't actually control even as much as you control your native uh, tongue so then yeah I, think, I mean it's it's uh, having when it's when you're writing with your mother tongue you have like just one or two strangers around but when it's uh, like a foreign language you have even more of those strangers around that kind of write with you and it uh, yeah it's, that makes it a little bit more Difficult times, I suppose. Thank you. And as we don't have very much time left, I would like to give you both first the possibility of answering to the starting starting question, which was, what is the situation of poetry today in France and in Finland? If if after this discussion you have come to a conclusion, did we speak about? the situation of poetry today in France and Finland, or did we actually speak about your way of, uh, of working? Do you want to say a word? No. <laughs> uh, no. No. <laughs> uh, no, it's very personal. For, for me, it's very personal. Um, why 
did you ask the most difficult question at the end? <laughs> um, and no, it's, it's so personal, but what in the state of poetry in France? Uh, yeah, I cannot answer that question. So, yeah. Um, I think it's the same in every country, in every field. If you're in the stream, no problem. If you're out of the stream, work and good luck and meet some people. Um, yeah, maybe something, wait, well, says nothing on the poetry in France, but meet some people. Work on your desk, but going out and meet some people is important to make something interesting. Um, place of poetry in France, I'm dry. <laughs> Of course, we were speaking about this before and say wondering if we managed to do this or not. Do you have any conclusion conclusion on this subject? Um, I, I have a couple of platitudes and then <laughs> and something else. Uh, the platitude side would be that there are very different uh, different poetries around in Helsinki at the moment, at least. I, I'm not sure if I can speak of the whole country. But what I'm knowledgeable about is that you have various different kinds of poetry going around, which is, I mean, that's great. Um, in Finland, uh, the more open question would be, or idea would be, that in, in poetry is not, of course, uh, doesn't do super well on the market. So uh, you don't have a lot of bestsellers on poetry, and this is not the way you can't, even if you're in the milk stream. And honey. Milk and honey is the best seller. Yes. Yeah. So we don't have that uh, in so much in, in Finland. So my idea is that in nevertheless we have a grant system. So there are public there's public funding for poetry, there's private funding from foundations for poetry. And I think this creates a small uh, kind of pocket that has a slight amount of autonomy from the market that then poetry can work a little bit from, with different uh, laws than the laws of the, the, the economy of the exchange of the market. Um, and I think that is a big uh, factor in Finland actually, today. And, uh, and I've heard it's better than in many other countries while talking to, uh, to people. That said, if there are any people who uh, are funding poetry, it's never enough. There is a can there's room for more. So this would be my... Thank you. And we had this uh, question because it was somehow the introduction of the occasion. But I don't want to sp stop uh, or end this uh, discussion with uh, market uh, considerations, rather with poetry. So, uh, Matti, you said that you could eventually read us a poem, and maybe you could as well. So maybe you, we can have uh, two little readings, and then if we have time, if we have a permission, uh, questions from the public, if uh, there are any. Yeah, uh, is, are there people who don't understand French at all here? So, I'm going to read something called um, The Way of Dreams. We don't know why, before the lead sealed the mouth of a manhole, we watch the steering of the grey brow of summer showers and follow the concentric orb to mystic lightheadedness. We directed our dancers to ignore the shopping galleries and in the rancid space of empty shops 
fingers tightened on the maps of time in a druidic language that runs like ivy of a plaster and brick. Behind iron shutters, we prayed to the wind as it moaned under doors that it would reveal the trail of the last of the cosmic bearded ones. Bearded ones. Discarded umbrellas, wallets, pieces of fabric are to us as the oracles of torn bats. And passion here offense, we note the last thoughts that escaped from the broken jaws of large suitcases. The first passers-by find us asleep like a runaway orphan at the foot of a lime tree drunk on rich soil and rain, with an infinitesimal remaining sheen. We taste of the ash of free newspapers and restaurant menus, instructions in 28 languages of mixers and convection ovens we burned, hoping to find the way to the holy horizons among the dreams of thick smoke. Thank you very much. And this was from a collection called... This is taken from a book to come, which is called Hair to Disasters. Thank you very much. So this is what you will have to find if you want to reread it, because it is very tight text. Yes? Excuse me. Could it be possible to hear the same text in French? No. Yes, no, of, course. Say, yeah. of course. Of mm course. -hmm. Oh, of course, if you have it here. Yeah, I think it's possible. <laughs> Instant translation. Yeah. La voix rêvée. Nous ne savons pas pourquoi, devant la bouche plombée d'un ego, nous avons regardé tourner le brouet gris des averses d'été et suivi l'ordre concentrique jusqu'à l'étourdissement mystique. Nous avons dirigé nos danses vers les galeries commerçantes ignorées et dans l'espace rance des magasins vides, les doigts crispés sur les cartes du temps, dans une langue de druide qui coule comme le lierre sur le plâtre et la brique. Derrière des rideaux de fer, nous avons prié le vent qui gémit sous les portes pour qu'il nous révèle la piste des derniers barbes cosmiques. Les parapluies, les portefeuilles, Les morceaux de tissus abandonnés sont pour nous comme des augures de chauves-souris déchirées. Et nous relevons en patient hiérophante les dernières pensées que de grandes valises aux mâchoires cassées laissent s'échapper. Les premiers passants nous trouvent endormis comme des orphelins fugueurs au pied d'un tilleul, ivres de terre crasse et de pluie, brillant encore d'une infime lueur. Nous avons le goût de la cendre, des journaux gratuits et des menus de restaurants, des notices en 28 langues de mixeurs et de fours à chaleur tournante que nous brûlons en espérant trouver le chemin des saints horizons parmi les songes d'une épaisse fumée. Merci. So it's a bilingual book. Yeah. Yes. Was, uh, yeah. It comes from Struga Poetry Events. Okay. Another festival. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Matti? Yeah. Um, I don't have, this book doesn't really have um, like poems. It has one long, uh, or one like long totality, but I've read, I'll read some. And this is in Finnish. Uh, so, those of you who don't uh, speak Finnish will be disappointed on that front. Um, huomenta. Tänään on torstai. Aamulla kirkas pääkallo avasi silmät, tarkasti pisteet ja taputti viivat, nousi ylös, kiinnitti tasot, valvoi niitä heti vähän, kääntyi ja kohtasi henkilön. Hyvää huomenta, henkilö tarjosi, mistä pääkallo ilahtui, liikutti hampaita ja otti sen vastaan. Nyt olen herännyt ja tämä on aamu, pääkallo huomautti, koska jo kulki tasojen keskellä.
ja suoritti aamiaisliikkeitä. Ei hassumpaa. Voi yö. Voi päivä. Iltapäivällä valpas pääkallo liukui tasoilla, nosti nesteen, laski nesteen, silitti ikonia ja tarkasti pisteet. Palvoi niitä heti vähän, tapasi roboton, syötti koodin ja hyväksyi ehdot. Tänään suoritan tärkeää tehtävää, pääkallo päätteli. Nyt täytyy olla tarkkaavainen. Paina nappia ja loppu sujuu kuin itsestään, robotto ehdotti. Pääkallo kääntyi takaisin ja neuvotteli tarjouksen. Tässä menee nyt hetki. Ja siinä meni hetki. Pääkallo sanoi, robotto, suoritan tärkeää tehtävää. Mutta robotto neuvotteli uuden tarjouksen. Tässä menee vielä hetki. Oi, tässä menee vielä hetki. Voi nyt. Iltaan mennessä liukas pääkallo muisti tehtävän, avasi etuuksia, unohti, odotteli tulevaisuutta, roikkui menneisyydessä ja puuhaili sijainnissa, kunnes saapui asemaan. Asemassa pääkallo tapasi henkilön, henkilön ja henkilön. Hyvää iltaa ne tarjosivat, ei hassumpaa, mistä pääkallo ilahtui ja otti sen vastaan. Tämä on miellyttävää ja oikein, pääkallo päätteli, koska kohdisti jo huomionsa ja suoritti hymyilemisliikkeitä. Pääkallo laski palautteen ja tarkasti suunnan, ei hassumpaa. Lopuksi pääkallo kirkastui. Muoto on kiinteän raja, mutta kiinteän raja on harha. Silmä neuvottelee rajan ja haluaa kiinteän itselleen. Rajaa ei ole. Se täytyy laittaa kiinni. Ei hassumpaa seurasi pääkalloa, joka huojui ajassa vähän eteen, vähän taakse. Irrotti tasot, meni nukkumaan ja tapasi henkilön. Hyvää yötä henkilö tarjosi. Pääkallo otti sen ensin vastaan ja antoi sen sitten takaisin. Muisto, muisto, tapahtuma, toive, tapahtuma, ei hassumpaa ja piste. Voi aikavuus, voi tilavuus. Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, sorry for you if you, you don't speak uh, uh, Finnish because it was really nice. <laughs> also, so uh, normally we are uh, at the end of our our discussion. Um, uh, do do we still two short questions? We have uh, time for that. Very nice. So if, if somebody wants to pose a short question, please. Uh, I just had a question about the process of writing. When you write, do you write for yourself first, or do you always think about who are you writing? No, just for me. Uh, yeah, maybe just for me. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think it's mixed. So I have a, I have, let's say, 50 notebooks with stuff that uh, I hope nobody ever reads. But I will use that stuff, and while I'm writing, I probably one stranger is like lurking behind and saying, oh, "Yes, this will be a poem." Yes, because yes, yes, uh, when did you write the first poem, and when did you realize that you could like do anything with it, or was it just for yourself first? <laughs> <laughs> you, I must be honest, you're gonna laugh at me. My first poem was on. Uh, birthday card for my mother when I was like five or six. <laughs> yeah, honestly. And uh, at this point I could not realize if that was good or not. I I read it because she, she, she gave it to me. I said, no, I said, yes. This was kind of, um, yeah, not good, but from a five years old child. When did I realize that I could do something with it? which is a very interesting and important question. Um, I think from the moment I sent some poems to someone, I think I thought that I could be that person. Um, that would be my answer. Not the fact that someone accepted it, but the fact that I took a step uh, outside from it. Said, okay, I'm going to. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think I was I wasn't five. Um, I, I was I was a teenager, 
And for me, the, the second part of the question, uh, the realization that when you do write things down and you uh, do stuff with language, you uh, somehow end up creating stuff that you uh, didn't think about in advance, you didn't know about necessarily in advance, and that actually do does things that you don't, you didn't think about uh, that it would do. And for me, this was probably the moment that I realized that uh, I can write stuff. It's not really, after it's written, it's not tied to myself anymore. So then I can just kind of, you know, throw it away in, in, in a sense. Of course, then there was 20 years of, uh, um, of uh, being an aspiring poet, of course. But this was probably the first, first thing. And as there was uh, two questions at the same time, I, I take the very last, tremendously last, to you, and uh, that, that's that will be the last question. I understood that you are not always uh, that happy with the English translations. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of doing the translations yourself, yourselves? Yeah, but yeah, but you have to show humility when you have. Uh... I don't know, a lecturer at the Dublin University, and you're discussing, okay, I'm going to translate it, but, but I mean, I think you're right, because you can have uh, degrees, diplomas, or whatever, if, if you're not a poet, and you yeah, try to translate, exactly. that's not good. Yeah. So I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the texts we're going to uh, do tomorrow was translated by myself, so yes, I've tried. Uh, helped by people, but after they read it, after my translation, to say to me there are some big mistakes and that kind of stuff. But interesting question. Yeah, so you have to have it revised by, by somebody native. Um, not especially native. Okay. Not especially native, but with a good feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I could also imagine uh, collaborating with a native speaker. So I would do the, the first version myself and then show it to a native mm. speaker and they would tell me and then we would start that, that kind of conversation. So in a way you have to, to write the, the poem twice. You have to rewrite it, yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Yetka, Marti, it thank was you. a pleasure. Thank you everybody, uh, it was a very nice, uh, very nice to have so many of you here and good questions and a nice public. Uh, there will be a nice uh, glass of uh, wine after there. So, uh, cider. Let's, <laughs> cider. Let's ask go and taste. Thank you.